Bridget isn't often someone that you bring up when you talk about the dead, the ancestors. You may bring her up with mourning because, according to legend, she was the first person to king in the land of Aya, over the loss of her son. In my working with Bridget, I have found an interesting relationship between her and our work with the ancestors. I would like to talk to you about that today as we walk together down creation's paths. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christopagan Druid and Priest of Bridget. Hello, I'm Brian. I'm the Christopagan Druid and sous chef to the Dajda. I think I've explained this on the podcast before, but when I say Priest of Bridget, I have been working with Bridget for quite some time and we had been talking about me working for her and taking a priesthood vow when the solar eclipse happened. This felt like the most appropriate time to do it. So I did. I have been working in this capacity since then. We, we have a very good relationship. She keeps me very, very busy. Lots of inspirations, a lot of work, a lot of craft, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Today, we're going to do something we don't usually do. Often, we're talking about stuff from history, from the tradition, much more scholarly. But today is going to be that most dread of all things. Unverified personal gnosis. Bum, bum. <laughs> that thing that we fear that you shouldn't, but we do. I'm going to be talking about my experiences with Bridget and how I have come to see her part in Ancestor Wood and how I think she might be able to help you with your Ancestor Wood as well. But before we get into all that, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on the app that you're listening to us on. We make original Christopagan and Druid content five days a week, Monday through Friday, and you don't want to miss anything. We've got a lot of stuff planned. All right. So I have told my story about how I got working with Bridget before. If you're not familiar with it, you can go over to wisdomscry.com, wrote it up over there, and you go check that out if you really want to know. I really do work with a very multifaceted Bridget. I don't think that any of the Irish deities are simple in any way, shape, or form. It's one of the things that makes the Irish pantheon so interesting to work with because you don't just have a god of healing and a god of love and a goddess of war and blah, 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 blah. Bridget is the goddess of poets and poetry and the inspiration of poetry. She is the goddess of healing. She is the goddess of mourning. She is the goddess of smithwork and crafting. She is the goddess who takes care of the animals that you have in your home and in your field. I, I could keep going. For me, I almost see it more as there's, like with people, there are certain personalities and things that are in their oeuvre that, that each one kind of has, but it's definitely much more personality. Yes. Uh, I know that I've worked a little bit with Bridget. Most of the time, my interaction with her was she needed something done. I was unfortunately the one she had to work with. I say this with all love, and I feel like the feeling was with all love, but it was just like, you're one of his. Uh, fine. That exasperated like love that you find with familial relations because she's like, uh, fine, do this and then go back to the doctor. I just can't right now. It's it, it funny, but it is very much the, that kind of personal. There is this very strong tribal nature to the Irish gods. If you work with one, you will find yourself dealing with others. It's through my work with Bridget that I have had dealings with the dog that I've had dealings with Angus, her brother. I've had dealings with Danu and the Morrigan, who I'm not going to get into that. It's like with learning Irish. Uh, she told you that's one of the first things you're going to have to do is make sure you learn it. Whereas the dog that to me was just like, you know, I would rather do a lot of other things than to hear you try. Please don't. And yes, it. she kind of was just like at first she was just, I could feel this like building where she was going to be like you know what I'm going to have to deal with you some so you're going to need to oh never mind yeah just never mind <laughs> which is why you'll probably never hear me even try to pronounce it because yeah so yeah. my experience of Bridget when it comes to ancestor war comes through three of her aspects and I know we in the craft like to break everybody down into triple this and triple that there are three triple Bridgets. And there's a whole, whole bunch of other things that Bridget does. 
This is not a triple rigid that I am talking about. It is just three aspects of rigid that I feel connect to our ancestral. One. The first is the Bridget of the Good Judgment. There have been many relationships with my ancestors, both that I have known personally and that I have found out about since I've been doing a lot of work, looking up my family tree and everything where I've had questions and concerns and stuff. Bridget has been very good at helping me understand, no, that is a bad man. Because the two, the two ancestors in question were both men. No, that is a bad man. You do not have to have relations. You can cut them out. You do not have to look at them as valued ancestors. You can see them for who and what they are. There's also the healing aspect of Bridget, which has helped me cope with some of my other relationships that were, I don't, I don't know how to describe them because they weren't bad relationships. They were tainted by something. She really helped me deal with my relationship with my great grandmother, who I both have very fond memories of and very traumatized memories from. She was an old country girl who I had experiences. I, I've talked about them before in some places and people get traumatized hearing some of the stuff. I so think, I'm not going to say any of the things on here. I think one but, of your best ways of describing her is Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies. Yes. But you got to remember there's the Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies that they put on TV because that's comedy and it's fun to see that aspect of her. But there was that same personality in all the moments that weren't shown on TV yeah. too. Rizzo. So, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. But she helped me feel with that. But the main one I wanted to talk about and the kind of subtitle for this episode is how she taught me how to work with my lineage. Because in many a dream, I have gone into the forge with Bridget. She taught me to see what I have inherited from my bloodline, my milk line, and my land ball as kind of raw materials that can be alloyed together to make me stronger, better, more capable at various things. And this work, which was very, I don't know how to describe it, very psycho-spiritual work, was about this profound smelting process. If you've never smelted metals, I've actually done this in real life. It's an amazing experience because you heat it up in the forge and the metal melts and the impurities rise to the top and you can literally scoop them off. Like, like when you do a soup and that kind of sludge comes up to the top of a soup and you can skim it off. If you do that with metal too, it's, it's called slag. It's the impurities that rise up to the top. And it was this very meditative practice that has occurred several times in my dreams and sometimes in meditation, when I go into the grove, I'll go in there and I'll see the forge set up and I'm like, oh, okay. This could be one of those days. It'll be one of those days. And it's this very meditative practice where it's very consciously taking either memories of an interaction I've had with a person, place, something from my lineage, some bit of knowledge that I have gained about a particular ancestor. And we kind of put it into the, into the crucible and we put the crucible into the forge. And just kind of meditating on it as we're heating the forge up and watching it melt. And as it's melting, kind of seeing it break down into its component parts and realizing which parts are good and which parts rise up to the top because they need to be skimmed off. What, what parts of that lineage is the slag that needs to get removed? What parts need to be taken off? But here's, and that, 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 that's a very powerful technique it's a very powerful thing and i think whether you have a relationship with bridget or not i think you could do this very easily through an active imagination practice through a meditation practice i'm sure if you have a relationship with bridget you could talk to her about trying trying to do this but there's something about when you're looking at an event or a bit of knowledge that you have and really separating it out like this and seeing what is the gold in this what is the valuable helpful metal in and what is the the impurities that need to be burnt off that need to be separated out really dissecting these aspects of our past our relationships i learned something about my father this is when we're really when we started doing this where i realized that my father and i are much more alike than i ever thought in my life and that kind of sent, sent me on a spiral for a while and this is one of those things where bridget took me into the forge and we put that knowledge, that new bit of information I had into the crucible, into the forge, really just watching it melt, just really cooking it down, 
trying to figure out what valuable material is in that and what just needs to be let burn burn off what needs to be pulled off what needs to be removed and really spending time with it and i can't i hate being vague i wish i could give you an act, actual technique for this but it really is different for whatever memory or a uh, bit of information that you're putting into it the symbolism really really helps watching it melt because if you've ever watched metal melt it doesn't melt like an ice cube it doesn't just root out parts of it will melt before other parts of it it gets hot spots and cold spots and little flakes of it keep solid much longer than other pieces of it and it, it take it's it's not a uniform melting right and in that image you can see kind of what does your mind keep catching on is definitely the parts that haven't melted yet because once you can see the different bits once you understand it then the slag starts rising up and the metal starts separating out and the imagery flows better. You don't force the imagery. You stick with it. If there's still something there, then there's unmelted metal. And you really stick with it and see what you can get out of it. And that's kind of the first half of the practice. And it's really valuable because it helped me work through a lot of resentment, a lot of, for some of my relationships, feelings of betrayal or neglect or what have you, depending on who or what went into it. Some of it was just sheer terror of wait i had what in my family somebody did what in the family <laughs> you know because you know family histories are long and complex and we are not responsible for the actions of our ancestors but it has effects that rain down to us to this day through our epigenetics and through just the way those people who survived those people that may have not been so good in the past that changed the way that they acted and treated other people all the way down to you so there's a tangible change that we've inherited. This process of separating it out is very important. But the second part was the most amazing bit. So now we have this molten mother. And Bridget would just look at me and say, so what are we going to make out of it? Oh, wait, what? That's usually where these kinds of meditations end, right? We've separated out the bad parts and we've cast them aside. And we all we have left is the good bit that we want to learn from or keep or maintain. What do you want to make? How precious is it? Is this a metal that should be a necklace, a crown, ring, bracelets? Is this something very strong and protective that should be a piece of arm that you should make for your chest or your legs or your arm? Is this a helmet? What do you want to make with this? Animal? And one of my favorite ones was a memory that I had of my grandmother that I had been trying to work through. And I realized it needed to be cast into miniatures. If you've ever played uh warhammer or any of those games where you make the little miniatures and buy the little kits where you get the molds and you melt the metal down that's a lot of my experience with making this also i took an archaeology class where we actually made art artifacts so that we could learn through the making of them how to read some of the marks on them and stuff this is even made into miniatures and well what kind of what is what is it up there are times when i'm struggling with certain aspects and that image of that miniature comes into my mind because now it's associated with that aspect of playfulness, that aspect of love and kindness from that memory of my grandmother. And it just comes into my mind. I smile. I feel that experience all over again. And I'm reminded to pay it full. And that, that second step of, and what are we going to make out of this? is powerful. And I don't see, I, I've seen a lot of like, how to work with your ancestors, how to work through memories and experiences and da 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 But it's always this first step of separating out and figuring out what you want to keep and what you need to get rid of and processes on that. But the, that second step of, now what are we going to make? We have this beautiful, precious metal. What is it for? Is it a sword? Is it the nib of a quill? What are we going to make? I'm over here chuckling. So my first thought is, make a horseshoe. Make a horseshoe. And someone would be like, really? They're just going to go on the bottom of the horse so it can step on it? It's like, it's armor for your horse. It's what protects your horse. It lets it go faster, actually. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but that's also where some of that symbolism is very personal. Oh, yeah. Damn. I'm just chuckling the whole time thinking. Wiggle. And honestly, I have. For some of my memories of my grandfather. Yeah. That because of the horse. Because uh, of the feet. So there's a lot of uh, happy associations with feminine horses. Are horse related because I would love to salvage that relationship if it were all poth at all possible. I don't think it is, but I can salvage those few good memories and keep those. And this is the technique that Bridget 
has worked with me on in doing this. It's really an impactful thing because sometimes, okay, well now we need to go make a mold because we're just going to pour it out, make a mold. Sometimes we have to let the metal cool and we're sitting there with a the hammer at the anvil and we're shaping. Now that's a whole other process because you're thinking of how does this affect me? How does this actually fit over this part, part of me? How does this actually give me the empowerment of if it's a ring or a crown or a piece of armor or what have you, right? How does this actually empower me? How does it need to be shaped? How does it need to cradle that part of my body, my body, my spirit? And it's a really interesting practice because it's personalizing everything. And it's, I don't know, it's just such a beautiful practice that I've wanted to share for a while, but it's hard to talk about some of these very personal things. But I thought with Samhain coming up and the ancestors coming and a lot of people are thinking about lineage and how they can reconnect and what does that connection look like, that it would be a really good thing to offer. And I know unverified personal gnosis is a big no-no in the community. But the thing is, I'm not trying to say that this is the gospel of Bridget. And I'm not trying to say that if you currently work with Bridget and she's not doing this with you, that your relationship isn't as deep as mine or as good as mine or blah, 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 blah. I am a world builder by trade. I make games. I make stories. It's what I do. So the idea that in my interaction with her, it would have this world building aspect of it of, well, how are you going to make your ring of power? How are you going to make your Excalibur? How are you going to make your legendary artifact, right? Really connects with me in a way that is very strong and visceral. And that may not be how you can connect with her. So I, I feel like that needs to be said, right? Because I, I know that feeling of envy you get sometimes where you're like, oh, that never happened. But I, I have a feeling that some people hear, hearing this are going to be like, yeah, she had me do that too. Well, it's funny because hearing that, I, I sit back and I go, yeah, I, the, the doctor has me, uh, we do a, something that's kind of similar in a way, but very different. And also it's more from that culinary background where we, you know, you know usually uh, we'll be hanging out and, or I'll go into the grove and I'll see him hanging out and I'll have the cauldron going and everything. And uh, they're like, okay, so, and then it's, you know, we'll sit down, some music and kind of ease into everything but it's in a way it's very similar where we're going to pull up that that moment and then we're going to break it down uh kind of like you know a chef would fabricate a protein or prep ingredients for a dish oh uh, because you know like in cooking it's a little bit different you, you can't just throw everything in the pot and expect the slag or you know, some stuff that will come up to the top but it's not quite the same way of separating it so you have to prep it and then you put those ingredients into the pot and then you cooked and then you have your final dish. And a lot of it, in a way, is very similar, though, still. Even though the imagery is a little different, you personalize. And that's that's the thing with a lot of these practices. It's going to have that personal inflection. I think it's a, just a, a very evocative way to practice. And especially this time of year, this is a good time to maybe sit with some of those memories that... Because we've done this for joyful memories. We've done this for baleful memories. We've done this for just facts that I have found out about people in my past. I had the joyful experience of finding out that during the Civil War, all of my family fought on the side of the North. Oh, I was be very happy because I was very nervous about that. But yay, we weren't fighting for slavery. Yay. As far as I can tell, my family never owned enslaved people. It's also a big yay. But there were th other things that I did find out about them that I also kind of went, oh, uh, hmm. but, but that. So trying to find ways to use those yays and those Ugh, and realize that that's all part of you you've all inherited that but what are you going to take from it what is it how are, how is it going to make you stronger better more equipped to live your life oh i thought it'd be fun to share yeah so if you find this practice helpful i think you should try it it works very well as an active imagination practice which if you've never done active imagination at the very end here very quickly Active imagination is the easiest and hardest thing you'll ever do. There are only a couple parts. The first is the invitation. If you've done mindfulness meditation before, you're, you're golden. You got to get yourself into that calm place. Sit, focus on your breath. Whatever you do to calm yourself down, get yourself to that calm place. And then you start inviting the unconscious to come up. Now you can do this in several ways. You can just sit there in the darkness behind your eyes and wait for something to show up or you can actively construct a scene. 
So for this, much like you would in a guided meditation, maybe construct your ideal form. It can be as fantasy, as steampunky, as sci-fi, as realistic as you want it to be. It's the imagination, bro, right? But we want to leave space for your unconscious to speak to you. And so you start having a dialogue and you will ask questions. You will prompt the imagination and you wait to see what happens. And you kind of let it start playing out in front of you. Now you can ask questions, but you shouldn't control the imager. You can guide a little bit, but you shouldn't control it. And you'll find this weird thing starts happening where you're noticing a distinction in your consciousness between your conscious thinking and sometimes words that you hear, sometimes the imagery that arises unprompted. This is active imagination. This is the basis of, um, of active ima imagination. Once that's happened, write it out, record it in some way. Pull out your phone, pull out the voice recorder, say it all down. Uh, if you have an iOS device, there's an app called Just Record that will automatically transcribe it for you. You can just load it up, say it all real quickly. There you go. You have it both in audio and written form. The next step, you interpret it. What are the symbols in there? What, what did you get out of this? And the fourth step, which is why, I'm sorry, Jung was a bit witchy. You ritualize. How do you embody it? You find some way to do a ritual and that's ritual in the biggest scare quotes ritual way. So if in your dream you do something more akin to what Brian was talking about and you make tacos, I don't know, maybe go out and have tacos, make yourself taco, right? Find some way to ritualize what you did. How do you make those symbols a little bit more concrete in your life? You don't have to actually go to a forge and make a thing unless that's your thing. If you're a blacksmith, you do you, more power to you. I know that. But you just find some way to ritual to, to do a ritual to make the imagery tangible in your life and that that's active imagination runs and repeat so it's fairly simple um we can do it as a guided meditation guided meditation doesn't let your unconscious work as much be more controlled in the imagery that's coming forward i think for something like this you really want to try to do more of an active imagination thing but make sure that you have a friend that you can call just in case you have a hard time turning your imagination off afterwards. Some people have had a hard time turning their imagination off afterwards and after inviting you, it. Sometimes you can be left in a, a raw emotional state yeah. too. So having a friend is, is important. You just have somebody that you check in with that can help evaluate your, your status afterwards, especially with the ancestor work, because there's, everybody has uh, trauma in their past in some form or fashion. And often the ones that are sitting hearing my voice going, I don't have that. You yeah. probably have unprocessed trauma, which is, you know, means definitely have that support system. Because uh, the healing's wonderful, but sometimes it can it can be uh, tricky. I would love to know what you think about this. I particularly would like to know what your thoughts are about us sharing our unverified personal gnosis. If that's the first time you've heard that term, it's, okay, unverified personal gnosis is something that you learn from your craft and practice that you can't point to in a book. You can't see it in the tradition. I can't point to, I cannot point to a story about Bridget where she d does something like this. I can't point to a poem, a poet, something in the, in the lineage that talks, talks about this. That's why it's unverified. And it's one of those things, it has kind of a trust me bro connotation to it because again, you weren't there when I was having these experiences. So. Do you trust me? Do you think that I'm being truthful? That's what unverified personal gnosis means. This is knowledge that I gained through the craft. I do want to point out that all craft was unverified personal gnosis at some point until somebody wrote it out. Yeah, that, that's one of my issues with that is a standard by which to dismiss. Uh, I think it all definitely comes with a yellow flag. Like it should be a caution moment because, you know, the, it needs to be uh, seriously discerned and weighed uh, because a lot of unverified personal gnosis is personal and mostly for the benefit of the individual practitioner. But I it talked to Bridget mean, about this. She was okay with me sharing it. It doesn't mean that it's bad, you know. It is what it is. But we we haven't shared a lot of our, you know, you know, IPG is it's often shorthanded. I guess often also if if you all think that maybe that should be a entire episode topic in and of itself, yeah. like we could do an episode and then personalize for uh, unverified personal gnosis. And we can also laugh and see how many times I can say it right or mix it up. What are your thoughts about us sharing any of that with you all? I came from a very charismatic tradition when I was 
practicing Christianity. So that was not uncommon to t talk to other people about your visions, your experiences. When you felt the voice of God speak, speaking, it was not uncommon. Again, as with all things, I think we take tradition too seriously. I think we take our experiences too seriously. And I want to warn against all of that as I normally do. But yeah, what do, you, what do you think about us sharing more of these kinds of experiences with you all? Is this something that you would be interested in? Let us know in the comments. I think that would be very helpful for us. Also, if you do try it out and you have an experience that you'd like to share, I would love to hear it. If you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if they say you can leave a comment, you can leave it there because engagement is great. But they will not let us know that you did it. So head over to creationspaths.com. Click on chat and you can share it there and we will get notified and we'll be able to have a conversation with you. While you're there, if you have a few dollars you can pass our way, you can think about becoming a member. You can also support us on Patreon and Ko-fi. I am CEO Dorsal on both. That money goes a long way to help us out, keeping a roof over our heads, to the our table, and the power on. Thank you to everybody who does that. Y'all are amazing. We, we are thinking about starting the fourth wall, especially because we have some products we may want to put out, some merch. Because I, I showed some of our friends some of the upcoming social media posts that we've got coming up. And we got a lot of, I want that on a bag. I want that on a sh shirt. So we might start a fourth wall for that. I want a new coffee cup. There, there are a couple I want on a coffee cup. Yeah. Personally. I, I, I don't know. We may. We may we're, we're talking about it now. It is a thing that we may be doing. Your opinions of that would also be nice to have in the comments. Uh, I feel weird tweeting merch for something like this, but... Some of the inner circle to get to see stuff early have started asking for merch. I don't know. We'll see. But let me know. Anyway, thank you all so very, very much. If you don't have any money, don't worry about it. You can always help us by sharing what we're doing. That really helps us out a lot. Just liking and sh and sharing and subscribing on the platform helps out a lot. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, leave a review. That helps us out so much more than you know, because we would like to get this podcast yeah. featured. Please, there. much gratitude. Yes. <laughs> that is so helpful to anybody who does that. That's so helpful. You have no idea. All righty. And until next time, may Bridget bless you with the war warmth of her fires so that you may find the strength to burn down all the things that are causing you pain and to find healing and wholeness in what remains. Amen. Amen. Amen.